Okay, this is your chapter five lecture. Chapter five deals with practice settings where you will commonly find social work being done. So get some basic definitions out of the way. Whenever I use the word community, sometimes that will refer to a geographic location, but sometimes that will also refer, refer to a particular group of people. I'm sure most of you have heard people talking about the uh, LGBTQ community or the Texas Tech community or something along those lines. So many times it's a geographic area, but sometimes it will be that organizations are just practice settings where you'll see people working. Sometimes I will use the word institution as well. Social services are just anything that a social worker might do in order to help a person, an organization, a group of people, whether that's embracing their health, improving their quality of life or helping them be able to function better in the world in which we live okay agency is just a catch-all term that would that would contain social service agencies as well as profit for-profit agencies where they are trying to make money to give back to their consumers or nonprofits where they still will make money and but typically that money is invested back into the organization to helping the people that receive the assistance, as well as paying folks. That's one of a, that is a common misconception that people that work for nonprofit organizations are not paid. That is not correct. Most of the time, people that work for nonprofit organizations are still being paid. That is just considered a business expense of the organization itself. Working in rural areas can be very challenging for social workers because of the low population. And because of the low population, they will also have a limited access to resources. As well as limited access to resources, the communities are usually dependent on a single industry for income, such as small farming communities, small oil communities, things like that. The reason this is risky is because when that industry goes poorly, everyone in the community can suffer. You think about if uh, you're living in a farming community and for one year the everyone's crop gets destroyed by hail, well, then you have potentially 75 to 90% of your entire community is needing assistance in some way, okay? It's just one of the common things that we need to consider when doing social work in a rural community. Some common problems that you'll see there is transportation. People often don't think about this, but if you lived in a place that didn't have a grocery store, there's places within 20 miles of Texas Tech, communities where over 100 people live that do not have a grocery store. So just getting groceries can become a task, all right? Lack of adequate childcare or unemployment, like I said before, if you've got a single industry that dominates the whole town, if that industry is not doing well, then unemployment can become a, a big issue. Lack of housing or substandard housing, insufficient health care. If a town is not big enough to support a grocery store, they are probably not big enough to support a doctor's office or a dentist or mental health counseling or many other things that we, are, we consider to be necessary for people to be successful in our world. Certainly extra difficulties in schooling. It's hard enough for places to get quality teachers. This is even exacerbated in rural communities because of the isolation. If you think about newly graduated teachers, 22 years old, coming out of college, they want to get a job. But many people, whenever they're 22, don't want to live in Tapoca, Texas, or La Mesa, or some other place like that, and be, you know, 60 to 100 miles away from other people their own age and things like that. So that can lead to problems. Another common problem in rural areas is because the communities are so small, you will often have dual relationships where if you are a social worker in that area, you're a social worker, but everybody you're investigating, you already know. If you grew up in a small community, then you probably already had some experience with this. In order to adapt, social workers in rural areas often have to be a true generalist and specialize in many different things such as childcare, 
uh, investigations, uh, adult protective service investigations, setting up and really being a broker to the people around you. You also have to work to emphasize the strengths of that rural community and develop relationships there. A lot of these small communities can be a little wary of newcomers and, and that can be an additional challenge for new social workers. Urban social work within a large city will have its own different set of problems. You'll have a lot more access to resources because of larger numbers of people. Um, you'll also have more economic levels. Many times in small communities you have the upper middle class and then the, the poor. In urban areas you're more likely to see the poor, the working poor, the middle class, upper middle class, and then the very wealthy. More overt crime and social injustice can sometimes be present in urban social work, but you can actually find that in rural social work as well. Some of the problems we see is with central or urban areas, a lot of problems become more visible because you see them. You don't often see homelessness in rural areas. That doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You're just not driving up and down every dirt road in Garza County looking for it. Whereas in more urban areas like Austin or Dallas or even Lubbock, you will see homeless folks. More widespread occurrences of discrimination and things like that. There's also a lot of psychological stress for living in a city. Many times they're overcrowded, noisy, things like that. To, as an example of the psychological stress, if I live just outside of Lubbock and I drive to Level Land every day to go to work, that's about 30 miles. It takes me about 30 minutes. And it's a nice, peaceful, highway driving, typically no traffic experience. It actually can be kind of relaxing. Whereas if I were to live 30 miles from my job, but I worked in Houston, in downtown Houston, and I lived on the north side of Houston, that's also 30 miles. But that might take me 30 minutes to do, but it might on many days take me an hour, an hour and a half, two hours to do. And it would not be nice, easy driving. It would be bumper to bumper, heavy traffic, stop and go, and a lot more stress. As well as making your eight hour workday instead of a eight and a half, nine hour workday, it might make your eight hour workday turn into a 12, 13 hour workday with traffic and things like that. So now not only do you have more stress from work, but you also have less time to relax and less time to take care of your other things in your life that you, being with your family and things, that you might enjoy. Whenever we work, whether that is in a rural area or an urban area, some of the roles that you will see are as a counselor, an educator, broker, and case manager. All of these are going to deal with a micro level of practice and one-on-one -on -one or one on two is if you were a couples counselor or maybe even a mezzo practice if you were doing family counseling or uh, small group counseling, things like that. I will tell you that these are the roles on your questions whenever you get to the quizzes or some of the reflection questions in the assignments. These are the roles. These are the roles that are listed in the text. Please pay attention and use the word role correctly in an academic sense. Okay. Whenever we're working with micro and meso families, we need to make sure that we're making an attempt to be culturally competent. You wouldn't, shouldn't go and interact with a family without knowing something about them and things like that. Part of being a good prepared professional. Also, when working with the families, we need to understand that a person's definition of family may be slightly different than ours, and our definition of family very closely relates to our emotional ties, much more closely than in your genetic ties. You probably all have friends that you consider family. To show you how, in many cases, genetic ties are not that important to us, if you think about cousins that you have, you probably have some cousins that you are closely interact with, that you see them and emotionally care about them and things like that. And then if we're also honest with ourselves, you probably have some other cousins who you're far less emotionally tied to. That your friends are much more important to you than those cousins, simply because they haven't been a large part of your life. Okay, So whenever we're working with clients and they talk about this person is my family, remember to pay attention to emotional ties much more so than we do our genetic ties. 
You can also find social workers working in macro practice, working with the government and making policy and things like that. This is also an important part of social work that many times gets overlooked by new social workers or people just entering their social work education. They don't ever think about working in this area, but this is absolutely a necessary place for people to be working. Two professional organizations that you're most likely going to hear referenced or involved with is your is the NASW, which is the social work organization that you can join. It is a large lobbying uh, organization that tries to look out for the clients as well as social workers themselves to advocate for more protection, better pay, things like that. You can join very cheaply as a student. The Council on Social Work Education is the body that accredits social work education on a collegiate level. So they come and they check out the schools that are that have multiple social work classes and make sure that you are able to get a quality education whether you are attending a big university or a small college or anything like that. They're just a, another step to protect you as students and to protect the profession itself.